I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps on your devices and turn to the, the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is our text today. We kicked off a, a series in Romans last week. Uh, uh, Pastor O.C. introduced it, did a great job, and, uh, and so we're continuing that. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1116 and you will find Romans chapter 1. Uh, and if you need a Bible, if you're here and you don't have one and you, th you think, hey, I'd really like to have a Bible, then please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God. Because we know if you read the Word of God, God will change your life. And since we're all about life change here at Calvary, uh, this is our gift to you. Hey, while you're finding Romans chapter 1 getting settled, let me just tell you about something that's coming up that I'm excited about and I hope you're excited about. Uh, but we are uh, doing citywide teacher appreciation at the end of this month and the first of May. Uh, for every single school, 12 different campuses, uh, we're going to go in and bless the educators that are there, the staff that are there, and let them know that we appreciate them and support them and encourage them. And uh, our life groups usually kind of claim most of the schools, but out of the 12 campuses, we still have about four or five left. And if you're here and you're like, hey, I'd love to be a part of that, maybe uh, you'd like to get your life group involved in that, or maybe you've got a group of friends, you say, hey, we could fix them breakfast. We've even got resources to help you do it. Uh, then uh, would you do us a favor? Would you email us at serve at calvarylhc.com? At serve at Calvary LHC. Our serve ministry handles this. They're the ones uh, organizing everything. But if you just want to bless teachers, by bless, I mean, you know, adding to their waistline, uh, you know, with some great foods, sugar, whatever it is. That they need. It's, it's late in the year, so they really appreciate chocolate for breakfast. But uh, uh, it's just something that we do. And I know that uh, I love doing it. Our life group uh, is doing Nautilus this year. So if, uh, if you want to be a part of that, then email us, let us know. We'll get you uh, an opportunity to bless. So how many of you would say that you have a good life, that you're blessed by God more than you deserve, and you're grateful and happy? Oh, look at that. Most of the hands in this room go up. That's pretty cool. I mean, isn't it awesome that God blesses us and we know it? Now, how many of you would also say that basically the world is a mess and it needs drastic improvement? Oh, look, just about as many hands went up. Isn't that an interesting dynamic? You know, we're, we recognize that we're blessed and that God is good to us, and yet we know the world is a mess. And we, we know the world's a mess. I mean, there's terrorism, there's disease, famine, drug use, abortion, sex trafficking, political vitriol, uh, economic inequality, immorality is celebrated, God is mocked, Christianity is marginalized. And a lot of the times, if you're like me, or in conversations that I have, you find yourself saying, how did it get this way? How did it get this way? How did the world go off the rails? And a lot of times we, you know, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll play the nostalgia game. You know what that is, where you look back and say, remember the good old days? The good old days. The good old days were so great, right? If we could just go back to the good old days, like before there was internet. <laughs> Does anybody really want to go back to there? You know, when you had to get up and change the TV by hand to one of the three channels available. Some of you are like, that world really existed? That's terrifying. Yeah, Google it and find out about it. So, uh, see, we, we know the world's a mess. How did it get like this? What happened? Well, believe it or not, the Apostle Paul in today's text kind of answers that question. But before we read the text and allow him to speak to us, uh, let me just describe the world at the time that the Apostle Paul wrote this. Uh, he was a citizen of the Roman Empire, which was the greatest empire at the time, and, and it covered you know, pretty much the entire Mediterranean world, went up into France and Great Britain, uh, all the way east of Israel. Huge place. Uh, you know, they were a, a political and military might, uh, but one-third of the Roman Empire was basically slaves. And in Rome, slaves had no rights. The master could do whatever he wanted with the slaves, including kill them. Not only that, but Rome was pretty much a, a place that lacked morality. Uh, now, the Jews were moral people, 
But, you know, that's because God had revealed himself to them, given them the law. So they were moral. There were some of the Greeks that were moral, but that was really more of a selective morality because they wanted to protect their, their bloodlines. Let's just call it what it was. They wanted to protect their family. So there was, you know, some morality for practical reasons. The Romans were known for their gross immorality. There was no rules, no boundaries. They didn't care. And one of the practices that was common in Rome at the time was infanticide. So if a baby was born into a family and the dad didn't like it, he could kill it. A lot of times children were just cast out on the road like trash because the family didn't want it. So into this truly messed up world, the Apostle Paul writes to the church, writes to the Christians in Rome, this letter of Romans. And we're picking up in verse 18 today. Last week, Pastor O.C. talked about uh, and focused on this statement that Paul made where he's not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Me and you included in that. Picking up in verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women who were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Wow. I mean, that's a huge text, and Paul says a lot of things. Uh, let me just point out some of the major themes in this. First of all, God has revealed himself to everyone. God has revealed himself to everyone. Uh, did you notice that? Right at the beginning, verses 19 and 20, he says, For what can be known about God is plain to them. When he's talking about them, he's talking about people. So he's talking about us, because God has shown it to us. For God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, we, are without excuse. God has made his presence known in creation. And, and we know this intuitively, right? Have you ever walked outside, looked at the night sky and gone, wow? Have you you know, watched a sunrise or a sunset, and, and I know you have because I see your pictures on Facebook, and, uh, and, and it's just like incredible, and you're like, look at that sky, what, what God has painted for us. Or have you ever stood there and just taken in the, the majesty of the mountains or the immensity of the ocean or listened to the, just the joyful praise of a waterfall? Maybe you've stopped to smell the roses and just to breathe in that aroma of, of flowers in bloom, seeing the intricacies of the design of God's creation. Or maybe you've just walked into a house where somebody was baking cookies and you just went, God is good. <laughs> right? I mean, because we know, and, and we wonder, how can you see all this and, and not believe in a creator? Or how about this? I don't know how anyone can do this. How can you 
hold a newborn in your hands. This precious life, and, and you see these perfect little fingers and toes and, and that little nose, and, and you see the image of their parents reflected in this little one and not believe in a God who creates. See, you've had those thoughts, and we've had those thoughts, and, and the truth is you can't really deny God's power. The evidence of God is all around us, and Scripture says it is clear for everyone to see. Of course, that always brings the question, at least in the conversations I've had about this text, what about the people living in, you fill in the blank, I don't know, deepest, darkest South America in the Amazon, people living in the outback Australia, people living in Muslim countries where you can't go and send missionaries that never hear the gospel, never hear about Jesus, what about them? Two responses to this legitimate question, one of them is kind, okay? I'm just going to confess that. Uh, I've got one response that isn't nice. But the first one is this, God is just. And I trust him because he says he's, he's revealed himself in creation to everyone. And so I believe that God is going to hold people accountable for the truth that he's revealed to them. I mean, he's just and he's merciful. And I don't know about you, but I trust God to be just and merciful toward every single person. Now, he's also given us the task to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth, and so we're doing that. So we send hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to support missionaries around the world who are trying to reach unreached people groups. You know, we, uh, we're involved in sending people to go and to tell the story of Jesus in, in places where there are people who don't know him. We, uh, we're constantly involved in this mission of trying to proclaim Jesus to the ends of the earth. But here's the thing. God doesn't even need us. There are stories coming from the mission field, especially in Muslim nations where missionaries aren't allowed at all, of people having dreams and visions and of Jesus. And they're coming and saying, tell us about this one, because I know that the faith I was raised in isn't true. You see, God's at work in the world, and, and I'm just going to invite you to do what I do, which is trust him because you know God to be merciful and to be just. Now, the second response that I have to that question is, is one I never say to someone I'm having this conversation face-to-face, -face, but I think it every single time. So I'm just confessing and putting it out there so if you ask me this question, you know what's going on in my mind because I want to be transparent. But if somebody says, yeah, but what about those people? What about those people, you know, here that never get a chance to hear? And, and what I want to say is, isn't it interesting that you care about the souls of people you will never meet, but you don't really do anything about your neighbor who's going to hell? You see, the reality is this. God wants us to share Jesus with the nations, but the people that God has put in our midst is our first mission field, which means right here in Lake Havasu City, there's about 40,000 people who are unchurched, and most of them don't know, have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't know the life-changing power of the gospel. They haven't experienced the forgiveness of Jesus, and those are the people that God wants us to be first and foremost concerned about because those are the people that we can influence with our lives, with our love, with the way that we share the gospel and represent Jesus. And, and we can't let go of that because of somebody who lives on the other side of the world that we'll never see. We need to take the gospel seriously here and there. But it begins right here at home. So the world is a mess. It's been that way since about, oh, I don't know, Noah. Okay? And God has revealed himself to everyone. So everyone is without excuse. What happened? How did the world get so messed up? Well, in this passage that we just read, Paul reveals the pattern of rebellion. The pattern of rebellion. Uh, the apostle shares a universal truth, a pattern that's been in effect for thousands of years for all of us. Look again at verses 21 and 22. He says, For although they, we, knew God, we did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but we became futile in our thinking and our foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, we became fools. Later in this passage, he talks about two exchanges, two decisions that people make that, that lead them on this pattern of rebellion, this pattern of destruction. And, and I want to talk about those two exchanges because they are key choices that are a part of this rebellion. The first one is spiritual pride. Spiritual pride. Um, look at verse 23. 
he just continues on. So claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They exchanged the glory of God for what they wanted to worship. In other words, they decided how they wanted to worship God rather than worshiping how God demanded to be worshiped. Now, they didn't honor God and they didn't give thanks to God. They replaced God with what they wanted instead. So uh, people decided to worship what and how they wanted, not God's way. And so you have uh, in history a, a plethora of false gods that basically people created. So in 1 Kings chapter 11, uh, Scripture talks about this god, Molech. Uh, he was a god of the people who were, who were neighbors to the Israelites. And he said, I want you to worship Molech. Molech uh, worship involved this. Parents bringing their infants and burning them alive. Yep. Somehow they thought that Molech would bless them if they brought their babies and offered them up as human sacrifices to this god. Or how about the gods Baal and Asherah, male and female gods of fertility that the Canaanites worshipped? You hear about them from Judges to Jeremiah in the Old Testament. They're all over the place. And, and God didn't want his people to worship them. But here's what ha involved in fertility worship. Because they wanted Baal and Asherah to give them crops and their animals to have lots of babies so their herds would grow. And they wanted to have kids. And so they would worship Baal and Asherah. And that involved uh, fertility worship, which was basically sexual worship practices. So families would send their wives and their daughters off to be temple prostitutes, and men would go to the temples and worship, have sex. That, that's, that was Baal worship. Or you can just go to the Greek ancient gods, you know, contemporaries with the uh, Israelites in the Old Testament, and they, the Greeks had a god named Bacchus, and Bacchus was the god of wine. And how do you suppose you worship the god of wine? Yeah, you get drunk. You get plastered. Celebrate Bacchus. And, and we listen to those things. We go, that's terrible. Nobody would ever do that now. How, how ridiculous those are. No one would be worshiping those gods today. Really. Because I think Planned Parenthood still worships Molech. I think our entertainment industry worships Baal and Asherah. Bacchus? I don't know. Have you guys heard of Mardi Gras? Spring break, every American sporting event that takes place. Um, you see, when you replace God with your own creation, then you're replacing biblical moral, morals and values with your morals and values. In other words, you decide to make the rules about what's right and wrong. And we really go off the rails with our spiritual pride. By the way, one of the dangerous temptations uh, for those of us who believe in Jesus is when we stop worshiping God because we don't like something in worship. Uh, see, here's the reality check. We are here to worship God, to honor and give thanks to God. And the biblical requirement for worship is truth with submission. So when we are telling the truth and it's combined with our submission, that's worship. So, but worship is about God. It's not about us. It's not about our likes, our preferences. See, we all have preferences. We all have likes, whether it's the type of music or the songs we sing or how loud it is or the type of sermon and how long it is. <laughs> Some people actually want me to preach longer. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> Some of you would like me to preach shorter. Probably not going to happen either. So I'm uh, sorry to disappoint but the, uh, you know, the, the version of the Bible that's read, the setting that we're in, you know, look, all that matters is that we are committed to worshiping Jesus regardless of our preferences. Because the first step in rebellion is spiritual pride. The second step in that pattern of rebellion is intellectual arrogance. The second exchange is mentioned in verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They believed they knew more than God. They believed they knew better than God. And it all started with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. If you're not familiar with the story, read Genesis chapter 3. It's where Satan comes to Adam and Eve and begins to tempt them. And he tempts them by saying, did God really say this? 
Did God really tell you that if you ate from that tree, you'd die? That's not really what's going to happen. What's going to happen is you're going to become like God. You're going to know what God knows. You're going to be like him. And don't you want to be like him? And they ate because they wanted to be in charge. That's intellectual arrogance. We think we know better than God. We think we know more than God. We think we know how to live life better than God. And it boils down to this. Do you believe that God is right and you are wrong? Or do you believe that you're right and God is wrong? Because it can't be both. It can't be both ways. You see, here at Calvary, we've already decided that. Uh, One of our essential beliefs, one of our core doctrines is this. We believe the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. In other words, we believe the Bible really is the word of God and we're going to live by it uh, because it tells us what to believe and and how to live. That's why we give them away to people who need them. That's why we encourage you to read them uh, because it is God's word to us, which means that God is right and I'm wrong. And if my life runs into Scripture and Scripture challenges my life, then I need to repent and I need to conform to Scripture because I believe that God is right and I am wrong. And if you haven't chosen to su- submit to the authority of God as revealed in Scripture, then what is your authority? I'll answer that for you. It's you. You're going to decide what's right. You're going to decide what's wrong. You're going to live life your way, and that's a, well, that's intellectual arrogance. So intellectual arrogance and spiritual pride uh, are those two exchanges, and they always result in destruction. It always results in destruction. Uh, Paul repeatedly talks about how God gave them over and gave them up uh, and describes all these behaviors that are uh, destructive in our lives. And and, and let me just say this. uh, This passage is often used, and appropriately so, to just simply be clear that homosexual behavior is not condoned by God. But that's not all this passage points out. And, and sometimes the church has, has abused it by making uh, homosexual behavior worse than a whole bunch of other sins, and it's just as bad as all the other sins. But if you read verses 29 through 31, there's a whole bunch of other behaviors that are included in this destructive pattern of rebellion. Just listen to this list, and you can do your own inventory. So they're, all, they're filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. By the way, in case you're counting, 21 behaviors are mentioned in Romans 1 that are destructive I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of more than half. You see, all of us are guilty. All of us have walked this pattern of rebellion. All of us need God's grace and mercy. All of us have no hope apart from the power of the gospel that forgives our sins and gives us life eternal. So let's talk about the follower's response. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, you believe that that he's the, the King of kings and Lord of lords and you've committed your life to follow him, then how do you live in this messed up world? What difference does it make what Romans 1 says to us? Uh, Hold that thought just for a minute, because if you're here and you don't yet believe in Jesus, you haven't yet committed to follow him, let me just talk to you for a minute, because I want you to listen to the rest, but really the most important decision you can make is about your relationship with Jesus Christ, because he loves you, and the power of the gospel is available to change your life, to set you free, to make a difference in you, but you have to make that decision that you're going to surrender to Jesus, that you're going to follow him, that you're going to say, hey, you know what? I need the power of the gospel to set me free. And I just want to encourage you, if you haven't done that, just you and God have a conversation and you kind of start that by saying, God, I need you to change my life and I surrender. 
He will change you, and he'll start that work in you today. But if you are a follower of Jesus, what are we supposed to do in this messed up world? Um, let me share some simple but incredibly difficult steps. Uh, first of all, we need to think differently. Think differently. In other words, we need to believe the truth of God. We need to decide to believe the Bible. And then we need to decide to read the Bible and learn the Bible and study the Bible and, and let God change our minds. We need to have the mind of Christ uh, and let this book influence how we live. I mean, that's why David said, Thy word, I've hid my heart that I might not sin against you. So Scripture is incredibly important if we're really going to think differently because we don't want to just affirm Scripture. We want to actually learn it and let it influence our lives. By the way, Jesus called Satan the father of, do you guys know this? Lies. Satan's the father of lies. In other words, he is always telling you lies. He's always trying to get you to do the things that are in that pattern of rebellion that will destroy your life and, and, and wreck your family and hurt you. That's his goal in this. I mean, Jesus actually said the thief, Satan, comes to steal and kill and destroy He's come to, we might have life and have it to the full, but, but Satan wants to hurt you. So he's always selling lies. The only way you're going to know what the lies of Satan are is if you know the truth of God's word. And by the way, Jesus said, if you know the truth of God's word, then the truth will set you. Yeah. See, we know the truth will set us free, but too often we don't know the truth. We need to think differently and that means that we need to stop thinking through a business mindset or a money materialistic mindset or a political lens we need to let God teach us and change our minds uh, but that begins by acknowledging that at some point in our life all of us all of us have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and then allow God to change how we think so we need to think differently. We also need to live differently. We need to live differently. I'm going to encourage you to, to go home and ponder the list in verses 29 through 31 again and, and, and do your own inventory. And then here, here's my profound words for you. Don't do it. Okay, verse 29 to 21, read them. Just don't do it, okay? No, seriously, live a life dedicated to God, a holy life. Be a person of integrity. Be a person of honesty. Be a person of moral purity. You know, be a person who's a peacemaker and a reconciler. Be someone who's encouraging and compassionate. Be kind and humble. And you can do that because of the power of the gospel that, that can change our lives. Jesus will change your life. You, you don't have to be, you know, mean and nasty and, and greedy and all those kinds of things that, God's values can flow into your life and you can be a new creation in him. But it means that we have to actually take this seriously and say, okay, God, I want to think differently. I want to live differently. And then I want to love differently. You know, we know that love is a big deal to Jesus. We want to love like Jesus. He told us we're to love our neighbor as ourself. We know that the, one of the last things he said to his disciples before he got crucified was, a new command I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Can I just be really blunt? We're not going to change this world through politics, through economics, or through military might. It's not going to happen. We're not going to change this world through boycotts or protests or passing laws or believe it or not, through Facebook posts. You know how we're going to change this world? By loving people like Jesus. Through the power of the gospel to transform lives. That's what's going to make a difference. If you want to change this world, then start loving people like crazy. And I know some of you are going, Pastor, that's so naive. That's not going to work. You don't understand. This is a rough and tumble world. And if I start going out there and living by Jesus' ethic of love, then I'm going to get obliterated. Tell that to the apostles. When Jesus left this earth, he put 11 men in charge. Actually, remember there were 12, but one of them abandoned ship. 11 men in charge. Those men had 
zero influence politically. They had no economic power. They had no military might. And in 300 years, they transformed an empire. How'd they do it? By living out Jesus' ethic of love and sharing the gospel that has the power to change lives. That's what they did. That's how they were known. Those crazy love people. What if we did that too? I know it's crazy, but what if we did that too? I mean, Paul actually said, hey, you know what? Uh, he, he wrote these letters. Half of his letters he wrote from prison. And, and, and prison bars and trials and persecution couldn't stop the power of the gospel. Couldn't inhibit the revolution of love that Jesus started. In fact, you know what the only thing is that inhibits Jesus' revolution, the movement of the gospel is? The only thing that slows down the gospel is people who claim to follow Jesus and let yet live the pattern of rebellion. That's it. Nothing else can slow it down. So are we going to be a bunch of rebellious children or are we going to join Jesus' revolution of love? You have no excuse. You know the truth. So are you going to walk the path of rebellion or are you going to think and live and love like Jesus? I know what my choice is going to be. I pray that you choose the revolution of love. Let's pray.